Hey everybody, this is Aaron in the Air. Welcome back to the channel, stoked you're here. Today, I've got the third video in this series with my friend Gavin McClurg, talking about his awesome new book, Advanced Paragliding. And we are making this series as a way to share with you some insights that he learned from his career paragliding, as well as his lessons that he took from the world's best pilots on his Cloud-Based Mayhem podcast. So today we are talking about safety and progression, some key insights from the book, as well as both of our careers in paragliding that can help you understand how to learn a bit safer and also to keep your progression moving and understand the path that it might be. So if you're a serious pilot, you probably want to consider having this book on your shelf. It's packed full of so many good insights on so many different topics. I have a link in the description below to buy the book. Consider it. Also, if you like this channel and you want to support me, consider following me on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash airy in the air. You can do it for as little as $5 a month. I also offer philosophical coaching as well as paraglide coaching over Zoom. So if you want some help in your paragliding career or in your life in general, consider looking me up. So without further ado, today we're talking about safety and progression, just something that's so important. I hope this helps. Here we go. Okay, Gavin, we're back after a long hiatus. Welcome back from the Mar Monarca. Thank you, man. Uh, it was a it was a really fun week, as it always is in Valle. Yeah, don't tell me. I have FOMO already. <laughs> um, today we're going to talk about safety and progression. There's a really good chapter in the book titled "How to Progress Safely." It's got some really good nuggets from Russ Ogden and Chris Santa Croce and Nick Grease and Tio DeBlick, and I think the I, I love Chris Santa Croce is one of my favorite voices for sanity and safety in our sport. And he's got this quote in here talking about how working a progression in a thoughtful way is a beautiful art. It's a cornerstone of life. I love, yeah. Santa is, you know, he was my instructor. He's who I learned from mm. early on. And you know, he'd gone kind of through his wild days at that point. And, you know, kids were in his future at that point. He didn't have them then, but, you know, you could tell things were, were moving in that route or in that direction. And I, I was just, before we started here, I was kind of going back to this chapter. I think it's one of the best in the book. Uh, there, there's some really solid foundational stuff here. And, but I remember recording that with Chris. I actually drove down to Salt Lake to do that one in person. And he talks about keeping it between the lines, you know, like when you're driving, I mean, that, that's basically all you got to do you know, yeah. is keep it between the lines. And I love his concept about, you know, that we don't have to throw ourselves, we don't have to bang ourselves into the wall to get huge flights and just take huge risks yeah. and push it and push it and push it and push it to get those numbers. You just got to go out on the right day. And this is a lot, this, Alex wasn't in this chapter, but we've got a whole chapter on Alex Roby. And that was, you know, that was, that's his method of handling risk and being safe is, is flying really good days. You know, he gets five or six days a year where he can go out and go big because he's, he's got work and family and, and by going big, I'm talking 300 FAIs. I mean, he's one of the best in the business and, and that's how he manages risks is he goes, it's not risky. I, I fly in conditions that are perfect mm. and it's not hard. It's not dangerous. There's not a lot of lead. There's no wind. You know, it's just a really good day and I can press bar all day and go flat, go fast. And I don't have to take a ton of risk. And so, and that's what Chris is basically saying here in this quote, I'm more articulate than I just did, but uh, I like that. We got to keep it between the lines. Yeah. And staying in your lane, stay the, in your lane, staying in your lane. Yeah. It's a nice analogy. I, I think what you're saying and what Chris is saying 
that we don't have to try too hard. And if we're ever trying too hard is when we're taking unnecessary risk. And that's something that it takes a while to learn that in paragliding. It does. We, you know, I came from other sports where you just give it some more try hard, you know, skiing. If you go off the jump and you crash, you just get back up and you try again. Yes. It's like, if it's a little icy, you just, you know, you speed check a little bit more and you, you know, you keep going. Highlining is the same. It's like, I can highline and like crazy wind and thunder and all kinds of bullshit. So coming to paragliding and especially when you're just like learning to thermal, you don't actually know what a cross country powder day looks like, Mm -hmm. you know, where you launch off and everyone goes up and everyone booms out and the students on ENA is just boom out to base. It's like, there are days where it just, it just works. And yeah, in the beginning, you don't know what you don't know. Do you, you know, and uh, I I went through that. This is, I think where we're heading here is how do you learn without making mistakes? right? How do you progress safely? You you can't just sit on your laurels and only fly when it's perfect. And only, you know, you've got to, you've got to push a little bit, right. To improve. And, and you have to make mistakes, but those mistakes in our sport, like you said, in highlining, they can be a pretty big mistake. You're just going to bounce and come back up. You know, Mm -hmm. you're, you're clipped in. Um, It's not that dangerous in our sport in aviation. It's pretty dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't, you don't get to just do it over. (laughs) Um, I think that's a good segue. The, the thing that I have kind of acknowledged is missing from most people's progression in paragliding or to frame it in the positive, the most important thing to facilitate your safety as you learn how to paraglide is mentorship. Mm -hmm. Because there's a big difference between instructorship and mentorship. Instructors will teach you the technicalities of what to do, and they'll keep you under their very close purview for a short period of time. But then once you fly that coop, you need people who know who you are, how you fly, what your goals are, and who are talented enough paraglide pilots and experienced enough to know when it's good and also know you well enough to tell you when you should and shouldn't fly. And that's a much harder thing to come by because it's not as clean and clear of a relationship as give me $2,500 and I'll instruct you to a P2 level. Yeah. I, I, you know, I I think this is a real um, challenging aspect that has not been solved in our sport. I think there are some countries and some, you know, institutional programs through education and instruction that are doing better than we do here in the States, for sure. Um, this has been brought up on the podcast quite a few times, but yeah, we, we pay our, we pay our money and we get our gear and we're, we get the basics less than the basics. And then we're kicked out of the nest and expect to learn how to do it. We don't, you don't do that in aviation. You don't do that flying planes. And so, um, yeah, I mean, there's this real seesaw you, know, you got to get to the other side of the of the of the bench and stay on the damn thing and that it's that can be really hard what you're talking about with mentorship to me if you have a if you have a professional sporting background like you and i do what you're talking about is coaching and coaching is technical right there's technical yeah. aspects of skiing when i was when i was growing up in, in ski racing you know there's all the technical side and there's the physical training side but then there's this mm-hmm. my the best mental. coaches would train this you know mm-hmm. come down and they they knew that they knew where to get in and how mm-hmm. to get in and how to sometimes you need to break that guy down sometimes you need to build him up you mm-hmm. know and uh and i might be dead today if i didn't have those mentors in this sport in in I paragliding agree. you know yeah. in skiing i'm not gonna die but in paragliding, you know, there's, there was definitely, there were people like Nate Scales and Matt Beaster and Nick Reese who were, you know, I would, they were gods to me and they still are. And, uh, but they saw it in my eyes. There was something wrong, you know, that this guy's pushing too hard mm-hmm. and they were, you know, they were gentle, but they were direct. And, mm-hmm. you know, when they understand your goals and, 
you know, they start to become your friends and they can say, Hey, you know, a little hand on the shoulder is a good thing. And so, um, you know, like Russ Ogden says in the chapter here, the, one of the things that's hard about this sport is it's incredibly easy to fly a paraglider, you know, (laughs) get handed a paraglider and have no instruction, whatever. And you might get off the hill and go land the thing. You know, it's incredibly easy to do, to do it. They're not that complicated a machines left, right. And you're flying real slow. Right. Um, but they're very hard to fly well. Yeah. And I like pondering that, you know, all the time is, you know, there's, there's a lot there, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of little things to learn that take decades. Yeah, totally. And to go back a little bit here, the idea that sometimes the most important thing a mentor or instructor will tell someone is that they need to slow down, which is a difficult thing to hear when you're learning and enthusiastic and excited. I basically, when people told me I needed to slow down, I told them to fuck off. Mm -hmm. That was, that was my response. Um, You know, I learned how to fly with an acrobatics glider and didn't realize that that stunted me in a number of ways, but also it really like, it's also very helpful in a number of ways. Um, But listening when people want to slow you down is very difficult. Oftentimes because you don't have a relationship with a mentor who you trust. So when they, when your mentor tells you to slow down, then you're like, okay, I need to slow down. But -hmm. if it's some guy at the Hill, you know, or it's like the local rule following guy, you know, you just tell him to fuck off. So And this, we're, you know, so much of, so many of the people in paragliding are men and the ability to seek out a mentor is a very humble exercise to say, I need, it's I need help. I need guidance here, especially in a sport where we're all trying to like save face and pretend that we know what we're doing and like be cool and be part of the club that like of people who can fly right yeah and and this is not to cut into what you're saying keep keep that thought going but it makes me think a lot about santa you know that that's what that that's what chris santa croce is talking about that we we really need to there's so many ties with the sport to life you know all those things that you just said we need to let go in life right yeah we need to let go in the sport i'm gonna close that loop i'm gonna close that loop so the you know we're we're getting pretty close to like legitimately like men's work issues, like your ability to be real with yourself and where you are in your progression in a very dangerous sport and, and humbly ask for help, receive guidance, parse out who is just egoically telling you to slow down and who actually can tell what is going on is a respectable pilot and knows what they're talking about and is giving you good advice. These are all, this is all the nuanced thing. And um, what Santa Croce is talking about and what I've heard him talk about in the past that I really, really liked. And also just as a segue and plug here, I've started online paraglide coaching and mentorship. I've never been an instructor of any of the sports that I'm professional at. And I've always been a coach. I've always taken the people who are good and made them better or who are learned and made them better. Um, so I've been offering that online. It's super fun too, but, and I think that is something like that is a way that we can start filling this void a little bit, but what Santa Croce is talking about And what I've heard him talk about in the past is the best way to avoid having an accident is to not be crazy about paragliding. You have to have the rest of your life in balance. Yes. You have to remind yourself before you launch that you like to eat dinner and that you'd like to have dinner tonight. Yeah. You want to make it home. That you want to make it home, that you want to like, that you, that you can keep your life in perspective, that you're not so crazy about paragliding that it's worth your life. So I love his perspective that the best way to ensure that you can progress safely in paragliding is to keep paragliding balanced in your life because it is an incredibly strong drug that you will get addicted to immediately. And it can take over your life, leaving you as a broke and 
homeless fiend on the sidewalk sucking dick for coke and <laughs> and seriously and we've all met these fucking pilots we've all met these pilots who are like so crazy that they're they miss the joy of paragliding they miss the lessons they're they the moment they land they're just already in the next flight they just they they're they're missing life and they're missing the 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 gift that is paragliding yeah and i think we can be I think there are a lot of things in this sport that are really good at giving you direct feedback. And I think we need to be receptive to that and honest with ourselves where we are in our progression, because there, there are very obvious cues, you know, how well do you ground handle? How often do you get plucked on launch? How good are your wingovers? Wingovers are, you know, as Theo, Theo says, you know, the, the master of acro in, in his, in his little bit, bit in this, in his part in the book here, uh, you know, he talks about the, the wingovers are one of the most dynamic and difficult maneuvers mm-hmm. in paragliding. Yeah. How good are your wingovers? You getting all the way over the top, you getting tip collapses, you know, are you blowing it ever, you know, because uh, they can, if you blow it, they can be really bad and super dangerous and you know but pilots who but i want to add to your perfect list perfect big wing overs are pretty good pilots they're pretty good at thermaling they're pretty good at ex- exiting thermaling they're yeah. pretty good at gliding they're pretty good at a lot of things and you know same with ground handling that there's a little bit in here with antoine laurens who i did the the my first big bivy across the sierras with and you you want to see an just unbelievable pilot in ground handling. I and mean, this guy was, is magic running around on cars, getting towed across parking lots, you know, just he's, he's magic with his wing, you know, like you see Theo doing on his Instagram videos and stuff, just on the ground. He's incredible. What do you think he's like in the air? He's incredible. And so he can do anything. Um, and that was because he had an accident his first year and said, okay, you don't get to go flying again until you're the best ground handler in this whole area that he lives in, which is France. <laughs> There's pretty good ground handlers yeah. in France. Yeah. And so, you know, that became his goal and he hasn't had an accident since. So, yeah. I mean, I, I think we can, I think we can, you know, rather than, oh yeah, I blew that line, you know, weird, something weird grabbed me there. That's horse shit. That doesn't happen. Yeah. That's, that's just bad ground handling. That's just yeah. bad preparation, it's bad training, you know? Well, there's also, you there's, have to go through it. You, yeah. you can't, you know, if you're going to fly, you have to go through it, but you have to, you know, we, we need to be critical of ourselves, um, but not too critical. I mean, just critical in, in the sense that, okay, this area of my flying needs some, needs some practice. Yeah. Uh, there's a, just a, the essence of that is humility and knowing where you actually are in paragliding, which, which is me, hard in the beginning. It's that is hard. hard in the beginning. You I mean, it's nowhere. still, I mean, it's still, hard. yeah, it, it's not that it's not as hard now that I can't even get into the competitions that I want because there's hundreds of pilots who have double a ratings who want to go to the comps that I do that, you know, like have years and years and years of experience in the world cup and all this stuff. So it's like, it gets a little easier. And literally my first experience of being, humbled to the level of paraglide and I traveled to France and I saw that the, you know, there was a day I was like, this is not launchable. This is over the back and cross and the tandem pilots are taking off and everyone, no solo pilots were launching. You know, I was like, Oh, this is like, okay. Like sit down (laughs) and watch it, sit down and watch. Um, And so knowing where we are in paragliding is really difficult. And the things that you're mentioning are proxies for your skill. How well can you ground handle? How good are your wingovers? Those don't necessarily mean that you're good, but they might be proxies. They're proxies, and, yeah. And I want to add to the list of proxies, like how many hundreds of stalls do you have? People are like, yeah, I did an SIV, I did full stalls. No, how many hundreds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I no, have I mean, thousands of stalls at this point, man. Every yeah. time I go out, man, if I have 500 AGL, I can like my on my ENC and my acro harness, man, deep stalls, dynamic stalls, there's so, I can do so many of them. I'm so used to it. There's also, how many years have you been flying? How many yeah. flight hours do you have? People forget the flight hours. They're like, basically, if someone says, I have X number of flights, I know that they're a beginner because they have been able no, to count their flights. Better, I got a better one. I have this rating. That, that's, 
the ultimate. I get emails all the time. Maybe I won't get them now that I've said this, but uh, I get emails all the time. I'm a P3. Okay, you've just told yeah. me that you completely suck. <laughs> well, because, me too, because, buddy. Because, me too. Because, <laughs> because you, but be, because you've put that in the email. That's why I know that you completely suck because yeah. these don't mean anything. Nothing. They mean nothing. They mean a little mm-hmm. more in France, right? But they, but here they mean nothing. And uh, what you've said before, you know, currency is what matters. Hours are what matters. And the also other kilometers. Kilometers, but it's hours. It's hours. It's just time in the saddle and time on the ground and time training and time. Yeah, but how many five-hour flights do you have? How many seven-hour flights do you have? Like I don't know. Like like if you can just like you go to Torrey Pines and you can just like rack up hours soaring, but that's not really going to do that. No, no, no. You're right. The right hours. How many two hundred kilometer flights do you have? I don't know, a lot, man. I don't do tons. I can't, I'd have to go back and look a lot. And, and, and what I'm, I mean that rhetorically, I mean that as a proxy, like that's another yes. proxy. Like how many it's thousands of cross country kilometers have you flown? Yeah. Right? And, 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 you know, I mean, yeah, typically a five, 6,000 kilometer a year kind of thing, yeah. but it's, but it, 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 you're, you're absolutely right. What you're, what you're talking about is this is the other question I get all the time is how do I get there fast? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I want to get there. Yeah. And you see this, this is the, this, there's a huge crossover here with wings, you know, as soon as you get into the comp game and you get dusted by the, the, the CCC gliders, what do people want to do? They want to step up Yeah. wrong. That's the wrong answer. You know, it's the, the, you step up when you're super bored and you're totally ready. And you know, when that, when that is, it's not because your glide performance isn't as good as the pilots that are better than you. We saw this in the ozone comp, you know, this sport class comp last summer, who won the sport class comp? It was all the legend, really, really good pilots that were flying Alpinas. You know, they're, they're, they're still the best pilots, so yeah. they can still do it on the lower wings. And so to get there, to get, there wasn't one of those pilots that won Donizette and Josh Cohn and Nick Grease and Nikki Siegel and Russ Ogden and all the, the, the best of the best. Guess what they all have in common? Years, yeah. decades so much time, you know, so it's, it's, it's dedication. Russ Ogden just won the worlds. He's a test pilot. This is what he does every day. He stalls his gliders every day for decades. He's been doing this, you know? So um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's mind boggling. And that might be, oh my God, I can never get there. I'm a weekend warrior, but there are no shortcuts. You know, if if you want to get good, you've got to just spend the time. You know, I I think that there are certainly there, there is a stratification of talent. You know, there's certainly a talent is, is one tiny piece of the puzzle here, but I guarantee you that Kriegel has worked harder than everybody. That's why he's so good. Yeah. And I, I think to, to like close the circle here, the idea that you're going to need to, you know, 10,000 flight hours, the idea that you're going to need all of this time and to bring it back to Santa Croce's point of you have to keep it between, keep it between the lines. You just got to keep it on the road, man. You don't even have to go that fast. That's you just it. have to keep it on the road. the The road will take you there if you can just stay in your lane. If you don't yeah. push too hard, if you can keep yourself from burning out or killing yourself or hurting yourself or like just like getting so frustrated, if you can just enjoy what you're doing and where you are and keep paragliding balanced in your life, you're you're likely to have a long and fruitful, enjoyable paragliding career. Yeah, because you're a long time hurt, man. And, and yeah, and I mean, that's, there, there's some other things here in this chapter that I really love, you know, just incremental steps, fly with people who are better than you are, mm-hmm. finding mentors, you know, all these things, they're not cliche, we, we hear them a lot on the show, and we hear it in the book, but, you know, when I think about my own history in this sport, these things matter, yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's also really nice one of the greatest compliments I get in, in, in emails that come in from time to time about the show is that they say that, you know, something they've heard in the show is, some, is something they kind of channel in their, either in their mm. life mm-hmm. or in their flying. Yeah. And I think this is really important, you know, whether, you know, to have a few little mantras, like I'm going to keep it between the lines today. Mm-hmm. I'm going to keep it between the lines every day. It, 
maybe that's a good one for you. I'm not, I'm not saying use that one, but it's, it, that kind of works, you yeah. know? And, uh, and we all know when we're drifting off the road. Yeah. Great, dude. This is, we, we came full circle. Cool. On, on to the next chapter. Right on. What's, what's next? <laughs>